sometimes when you talk to many near-death experiences who assume that they left their bodies and therefore their brains behind, you start wondering, where do we ever get this crazy idea that brains are involved in thinking? You know, where did it come from? Obviously, it comes from our everyday lives. In our everyday lives, it seems as if the mind and the brain are the same thing. When you get knocked on the head, you don't think very clearly. When you get drunk, you don't think very clearly. It seems very obvious that the state of our brains affects the state of our thinking, our emotions, our thoughts, our feelings, our desires. And that seems to hold true for much of our daily lives. It doesn't seem to hold true in the extremes. Let me give you an analogy. Henry Stapp this morning talked about Newtonian mechanics, which was accepted for 300 years, 400 years as a description of this wonderful clockwork world we live in, which was perfectly acceptable. And Newtonian mechanics, treating the world as if it's billiard balls, works very well for most of our daily lives. When you throw something up, it falls down all the time. The harder you throw it, the faster it goes. Newtonian mechanics works fine for everyday life. It's only when you get to the extremes of measuring extremely small particles or extremely fast speeds that the Newtonian model breaks down. It's not that Newton, Newton was wrong. It's just that the formulas he was using are a limited case. And when you get to the extreme examples, his formulas no longer work, and you need relativity to make the corrections. In normal everyday life, the, rel the corrections that relativity adds don't make much of a difference, and Newtonian's formulas are a good approximation. I think the same thing is going on with the brain and the mind. In our everyday life, assuming that the brain and the mind are the same thing works perfectly fine. It's only when you get to the extreme cases, such as when the brain stops functioning, that you see the analogy breaking down, and brain and mind do not seem to be the same thing. The most common example that's talked about now is the near-death experience, where you have people, many people who seem to be clinically dead, a few people who've actually had flat brain waves documented, who come back saying, not only was I thinking, but I was thinking more clearly than I ever had before. But we also have other examples of cases in which when the brain is compromised, people think more clearly. There are exceptional cases of people who have irreversible dementia or severe mental illness, who in their dying moments before they die become perfectly lucid. They start recognizing family members, they start talking coherently, they lose their delusions, and then they die. What is that all about? We don't have a materialistic explanation for this. If you assume that mind and brain can separate when the brain starts to deteriorate, then you have an explanation. You can't do a lot of research on that type of experience. Those are just isolated anecdotes, and believe me, they are unusual. Most people who die with dementia die with dementia. They don't come out of it. But we have these isolated cases that tell us something else is going on. But within your death experience, we have a potentially researchable lab to look at what's happening when the brain goes down. Now, we have ways of extending the life of the brain, for example, by hypothermia, by giving it different drugs to reduce its need for oxygen so it can keep going for longer. And you can argue about how dead is dead. But as Sam Pointy mentioned this morning, if you get down to the point where you have an isolated neuron, an isolated nerve cell still functioning, does it make sense to say that neuron is hungry or is angry or has consciousness? We don't think so. How about if you have two cells connected together? Can they be hungry? Most neuroscientists think you need an entire intact neural network to have anything like consciousness. And clearly, that is not going on when you have, perhaps, some rudimentary brain activity in the deep brainstem. Whatever you have, if you have any brain activity, it's not what we usually think is required for consciousness. So we have brains that are not functioning well enough to produce consciousness, and yet we have people saying, I was conscious throughout the whole procedure. In fact, I was more clear then than when I'm stuck back here in the brain with all the limitations of the brain on me. Is there anything that's verifiable in all this? We have people saying to us, yes, I was thinking clearer than ever before. That was more real than this. 
how do we know that there's anything to any of this? Well, occasionally people bring back from any death experience some verifiable information. And this is the same thing that Sam is trying to do with this AWARE study, trying to put targets that are unexpected in places where people can see when they leave their bodies. And we have lots of anecdotes of people who have done this, who have said, yes, I left my body, and I saw Dr. So-and-so kick over the stand, or I saw this or that, and they're accurate. And sometimes they are very surprising things that they report to us, things they couldn't possibly have guessed. We also have people bringing back from a near-death experience information they couldn't have, got, couldn't have gotten about other things as well. Sometimes they have met and communicated with deceased loved ones who have told them information that they couldn't have gotten in other way. There are cases of people who have met these deceased loved ones that no one knew had died. And we have many cases that documented this where people who talked about seeing deceased relatives included Uncle Joe, who everyone thought was still alive. And you didn't find out until days later that Uncle Joe had died a few minutes before this person has near-death experience. How do we explain these things in terms of neurological function? So these are ways in which, from a near-death experience, you can get some verifiable information, which can bear on the question of, are these things, quote, real? Obviously, they're real for the experiencer and for people who interact with the experiencer. Uh, I have the, the luxury of working with physicians. And um, you heard Jeffrey Schwartz this morning tell about the animosity that you sometimes face from scientists when you talk about, when you challenge their materialistic beliefs. I've seen that happen among a lot of basic scientists. I haven't seen it so much among clinicians, among practicing physicians. And here I really resonate with Esther Sternberg's hopefulness about where the future of medicine is going because doctors are much more like engineers than they are like scientists. They care about what works. You know, the scientist wants to know what's the theory behind this. If, it doesn't have, if you don't have a theory for it, I'm not gonna pay any attention to it. Where's your theory to combat materialism? You don't have one, forget it. Doctors won't do that. Doctors will say, if it helps the patient, I'll use it, whether I understand it or not. So we have something that is very real for the patients and very real for the physicians who take care of them. And with the objective measures we're getting now from studies like the one Sam is doing, we can have some more objective, verifiable information, which hopefully will cons convince the others, others in the scientific world that this is something that needs to be explained. We have lots of data that materialistic science can't con explain. I have here a book called Irreducible Mind, which my colleagues published last year. 800 very densely packed pages of scientific data from the world of medicine that do not fit into the materialistic model. Things from psychosomatic medicine, from faith healing, from placebos, from hypnotic effects, to near-death experiences. Things that cannot be explained by materialistic worldview. What is the materialistic scientist's answer to this? These are anecdotes. They're isolated facts. And that's all we have until we have a comprehensive theory to explain it. And I think that is partly why you see the animosity that Jeff was talking about this morning. We don't have a good competing theory. Now, Sam talked this morning about dualism, which is an alternative to monistic materialism. But there are lots of problems with that. When you get right down to it, Dualism has just as many problems as materialism does. We simply don't have the explanation. I would argue, though, that we have enough data now that we need to start looking for the explanation. Did I answer all your questions? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> okay. But uh, as a follow-up on what you we were just saying, I mean, if I, I follow your comparison of, between um, what Einstein did to Newton mm. and what we are facing now with these like uh, liminary cases where things get blurred, and, um, as far as I can judge, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, examination of what happens, uh, the, the mechanics of high speeds, uh, implies um, 
a revision of the, of the whole framework, even the framework that helps us uh, deal with ordinary speeds. I mean, the laws of mechanics hold approximately. And I was thinking that in the same way, um, and this brings me back to my very first question concerning the function, the, gen the general function of the brain, uh, according to you. I mean, yeah. does, doesn't, doesn't the experience, uh, the, the kind of research you, you are familiar with uh, concerning near-death experience forces us to reconsider the very basic assumptions concerning the general function of the brain, even concerning ordinary cases. And right. my suggestion would be, um, actually something that William James, people like William James and Henry Bergson at the beginning of the, uh, of the 20th century uh, formulated in a very nice way. They just suggested that maybe we were going the wrong way. Maybe the brain is not so much with that which creates consciousness or brings about all these uh, phenomena, um, not so much that kind of creative, active engine as a something like a reducing valve or something like a transmitter, much more like a TV receiver uh, that kind of translates electromagnetic waves into images and sound. Um, um, I guess this is where, where uh, your research points to, but I'm not right. sure you would embrace this view. Yeah. Well, I think, I think um, I'm not going to embrace any of those views because I think they're all, they're all models. You know, um, William James, who was living in the steam era, used the reducing valve, a model from the steam engine. Um, and people since then have used the television analogy that the brain is like a receiver for the television signals. We keep changing our models. Now with the mind is software and the brain is hardware. But the point is that the brain is not producing thought. It's receiving thought or limiting thought in some way. And in that model, the brain is the way that the mind has of functioning in the normal world. Um, I'm not going to embrace any of these things because I think they're all so locked into our very limited models. Let me come back to something that was mentioned this morning, and that's the, the role of language in all this. If you ask a near-death experiencer to describe what happened, they will usually start off by saying, I can't. It was ineffable. There are no words to describe what I went through. And then we say, Great, tell me about it. And we force them to use words. And then we write down what they've said as if that's the truth. But the fact that they, we made them use words doesn't mean the words were an accurate representation. And in fact, if you look at cross-cultural comparisons, there's a core near-death experience which is the same all over the world. But you don't have the same vocabulary described all over the world. Here, people talk about a tunnels. People in third world countries don't talk about tunnels. They may talk about a cave or a well, or one person told me about going into the, the stem of a flower. I had one truck driver told me about going into a tailpipe. <laughs> so your, your cultural background determines what words you use. People who come from a culture where you have a belief in a god will talk about seeing God. People from cultures where there isn't a god but the Buddhist cultures don't talk about seeing God in their near-death experiences. They may talk about seeing deceased relatives. They may talk about just about a warm, loving sense of whatever it is. When the Star Wars movies came out, a lot of near-death experiences say, yes, the Force, that's it, it's the Force. <laughs> I think it goes deeper than just our language. There's a problem in how the culture makes us think that distorts how we describe things. As Sam mentioned this morning, so much of the way we think about things came from the ancient Greeks. And in fact, our system of logic, of how we deal with ideas, is determined by Aristotle's, uh, it's called a two-fold system of logic, where things are either true or false. He postulated the law of the excluded middle. Things can't be both true and false. They have to be true or false. And that type of logic leads us to have what we've called mysteries, things we can't explain. So we can choose between trying to reduce them to things we can't explain or saying, it's a mystery, we can't solve it. That's because we're locked into this yes or no law of the excluded middle. Other cultures don't have this. There is a Hindu system of logic that was developed by Nagarjuna in which there are four different types of logical statements. Things can be true, or they can be false, 
or they can be true and false, or they can be neither true nor false. And all those are logical statements in their system. And when you think about what physics is doing these days, remember what Henry was talking about this morning. We have things that don't fit into our logic. So philosophers can say, well, quantum physics is illogical. Maybe it is by Aristotelian logic, but not necessarily by another type of logic. Is a photon a wave or a particle? According to Aristotle, it has to be one or the other. It can't be both. But in other forms of logic, it can be both or it can be neither. So maybe what science has to do, what scientists have to do, is get beyond our own prejudices and start using not only other languages, but other ways of evaluating the language, other ways of thinking. 